Mm -hmm. All right. Sure. All right, Cherries. Um, do you mind like um just talk about talk a little bit about yourself, like a brief introduction? Okay. Well, my name is Jerris Madison. I am the editor in chief at Obvious Magazine, and I'm also a uh, digital nomad and I travel globally um, to find like great finds for our, our readers or just people who are looking for like Airbnb alternatives or, you know, uh, traveling on a budget. Um, it all depends or even luxury travel. So it, it varies in the type of uh, content that I like to create for the brand and for myself personally. And then also I do secret hotel uh, reviews for uh, hotel groups. Awesome. That's wow. All right. <laughs> yeah, because I I've like um I have to read a article on 360 actually is another interview. I think um, it mentioned like you're also a fashion photographer, right? Yes. Yes, I am also a fashion photographer. Uh, I'm grateful I'm at the position now that I can be very um, selective on you know the type of projects that I do, but I also do you know album covers editorials, covers, you name it. Wow. All right. Do you mind share a little bit more about the, like the photography part? Like, because I've heard like you some do some photo vogue shoot. Like, do you have any interesting experience or like any work you want to share? Mm, well, I've been very fortunate that two of my big major uh, photography projects that I've done, um, one of them uh, won a Grammy and then one actually uh, got nominated for a Grammy. So I was grateful to be a part of two black women who are, uh, who are in the jazz space. They were both nominated and won one. And that just really makes, that was like a highlight for me because I was a part of their success. So um, that, and I'm also working on our uh, new uh, e-commerce collection uh, we're coming out with like hoodies and products and stuff. So I'm overseeing the creative direction on that. Though I won't be shooting it, I decided to allow one of my friends who um, who is better at product photography than I to just kind of help coordinate and facilitate that project for us. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay. And I also heard that you have you also have your like own magazine called Magazine Obvious, right? Yes. Yeah, because I followed you guys on Facebook and Instagram for a while actually. So oh, thank you, you. All right. Um, do you do you mind share like why you start doing this? Like your like how does it feel to have like such a huge Facebook following? Like, yeah. Wow, good question. Um I started Obvious um, almost 14 years ago based on a, I can sh the quote, I can show you better than I can tell you. I was actually working with another magazine out of Texas at the time, and me and the publisher at that time, we were just really having really bad creative um, differences on where I felt that the brand should go. And so um, I ended up quitting. And, but I knew that what I was recommending was like the next wave of what's gonna be happening in the publishing business. So I decided to create a magazine, um, one, to hi um, highlight the interests of men and the interests of women. Because generally when you deal with magazines, they're, at the time, they were very niche based. So it can only be for men and it can only be for women. So I wanted to change that conversation so I decided to create a magazine that was combined with both men and women interests because um, though I do wardrobe styling on the side, a lot of men were asking me, hey man, I want you to help me dress my woman and then vice versa. So I was like, well, why don't I just put that in into a magazine and also highlighting photographers like myself who've always wanted to shoot for Vogue and GQ and you would submit your portfolios and either they would reject you or you wouldn't get a response at all. So I created Obvious based on, um, you know, the people who were the underdogs. Um, and, and still to this day, um, I kind of 
consider myself an underdog, though I may have a level of popularity on social media. I do that on purpose because it allows me to remain humble because, you know, the more it's kind of like that Biggie song. Uh, what is it? Uh, more money, uh, more problems or whatever. And I felt like with social media, the more likes you have, the more scrutiny you have. And so it's 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 a blessing to have such a far a, a vast reach rather, but it's also challenging because you know the algorithms are always changing and it's just, it's very pay to play. It's not like it was in the early days where everything was organic and people were constantly seeing your stuff. Now they're getting to the point where you have to kind of pay people to see your, your, um, your posts. And I don't really agree with that because I don't like when brands kind of disregard the people who've made them these multi-billion billion dollar brands in the first place. So to be honest, I am looking at ways to, um, though I have millions and millions of reach every month, I don't really, it doesn't feel very fun to me anymore. You know, I feel like I'm getting to the point where I just want to just maybe focus on Pinterest and focus on, you know, our dot com more and building up the SEO based on that. But I don't really, social media doesn't feel very social to me. Um, like it used to. It's very negative. Um, it's inundated by with a lot of, you know, white supremacy and, you know, people calling you the N word and it's just not fun. So I want to be able to have a little bit more control over how I present conversations. And to be honest, as a small business, I don't really feel like social media is like, you know, required for a business to be successful. There are a lot of businesses that I follow that are major brands that don't even use social media at all. So I'm just looking at ways of just kind of removing myself and just kind of building my own tribe outside of social media. Awesome. Yeah, that's very impressive. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, so do you have any like future plans or like what's, what's next for the publication? Um, that's another good question. Um, I really, like I said earlier, I really want to focus on figuring out how to have a more solidified conversation outside of social media. Um, as you know, print is dwindling, you know, as much as we want to push print, people are always on their phones. So like we just launched a brand new website. And I actually did it while I was in Mexico City because I went to Mexico City for two and a half weeks to just kind of woosah away from everything that's going on here in America. And it was um, a very good turning point in my uh, in my spirit as a business person, as a person, you know, personally. And I just I just want to be able to create content and people read the content content or people view our content and say, you know what, because of this, it made me decide that I want to have a better life, or I want to cut toxic people out of my life, or I want to start my own business. And I'm tired of the, the bureaucracy that happens in corporate America. So I want to be able to, and we're doing it now, but I want to push it more um, going forward to just creating content and highlighting the underdog and highlighting uh, people that I feel deem, you know, that they should get the recognition that they deserve because there's a lot of people out here who are doing amazing things, but because they don't have such a huge social media following, um, they tend to get put on the back burner. So I want to be able to change that conversation and be the platform where people feel like, you know, I got a new album out, I'm a new artist, let me go to Obvious or, um, you know, I have a new clothing brand and though I can't compete with Gucci, I'm just as good, you know? So I just want to just really highlight more of people who had the mindset like I had when I first started Obvious. Awesome. Yeah, because I've seen like something in Obvious right now, actually. So um, like mm. focus on like people, like the, major the majority of people. So you want to like maybe focus more on that, like people. Yeah, because I feel like we're kind of like 
the baby of a little bit of Vogue, a little bit of GQ, a little bit of People Magazine, and maybe a touch of Reader's Digest. And that's why I like Reader's Digest so much because they always focus on the people. And when you focus on the people and you bet on the people, they're, you're gonna always win. And that's why when you look at obvious, you don't see us inundating our content with a bunch of celebrities. I feel like that's easy. I feel like, okay, what if you don't have the celebrities, then what, you know, what do you have to offer as a brand? So I've always banked on the people and I will always continue to bank on the people because there are a lot of people who need to be heard globally. And through my travels, I've been very fortunate enough to meet some amazing people that are just really out here just trying to make the world a better place based on humanity. And so I wanna be a part of that conversation. Awesome. All right. Um, so actually our interview um, is actually focused. We want to find some like beautiful people, like some great people, like who um, with some disabilities. So I've heard mm -hmm. like you have, uh, you have had an amputation before. So yeah. do you mind if I ask something about this? Sure. Yeah. Um, so like how, like when does it happen? Like when you get your like first feature and um, does that like impact your life and how it's happened? Um, you talk about how, how does what what was the question again? Oh, like um, when you get your like first amputation and how mm -hmm. it has like impact you on your life and how do you feel about it? Um, it um, being an amputee uh, really changed my life more than I could imagine, you know, both you know, good and bad. Um, I was 41 when I lost my um, leg. I'm now 49. So it'd be eight years in November since I've lost my leg. And sometimes it just feels like it was mm -hmm. yesterday. Um, I was mm -hmm. misdiagnosed um, by some doctors here in Los Angeles for about two years. And how I ended up finding out that I had uh, stage two going on stage three cancer. Um, and this is the truth. My mother ended up having a dream and I literally had just got off the phone with her. This was in August, uh, 2014. And, um, she was like, um, I think you need to come to Michigan, which is where I'm from to get a second opinion. And I was like, well, they already did a biopsy. They said I didn't have cancer. And she was like, no, something is just not right. And so I ended up getting on a pain. And at that time I was in excruciating pain because um, I had a tumor in my right femur. So all they were doing was just giving me opioids. And so now I can understand why there's an opioid crisis here in America. And so I got on the plane, um, long story short, um, I ended up getting another biopsy in Michigan. And then the surgeon was like, well, I'm gonna pull out the uh, part of the tumor that's causing you the most dis discomfort. Cause I, at that point I was taking like five Epsom salt baths a day. That's how much pain I was in. And so to my surprise, um, they came into the room with a uh, skeleton. And she said that, um, you know, this is your right femur um, and your right hip, and you have a grapefruit-sized tumor that's going down your leg, and then you have a double-sized grape, grapefruit uh, tumor that's right below your right butt cheek, and we're gonna have to amputate your leg. And of course, when she said that, I was like, it was almost kind of like I was on an episode of Charlie Brown, and you know when the parents come in, and they go, wah, 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 <laughs> It felt very much like that because I could not believe that she was telling me this, you know, because I never missed a doctor's appointment. I did everything that was asked of me here in LA and I couldn't understand why this was my outcome, you know? And so um, at the time when I researched amputees, I assumed that I was going to be an amputee cut below the leg or right above the knee. But to my surprise, because the tumor was so big, they had to amputate half of my um, hip. And so my amputation is, I'm cut right below my right butt cheek. 
And so I'm considered a, a hemipelvectomy amputee. And upon my research, I found out that um, only one it's only 1% of us in the entire world. So whenever I see other amputees that are cut like me on social media, we kind of gravitate to each other because a lot of people don't know, and I'm not saying that it's a bad thing, but um, people don't know that being an amputee is very segregated. And what I mean by that is like all of the Nike amputees who have the blades, they all hang out with each other. Then you have the amputees who are cut, you know, maybe missing a, a, a wrist or their hand or whatever. They all hang out with each other. And so it's very kind of segregated in a sense. And all of us are coming with some type of trauma. So it's just kind of hard to, you know, be there for somebody who's going through the same or similar thing because I'm still trying to process even eight years later, why did I lose my leg, you know? But on the flip side of all of that, after, you know, losing my relationship due to my amputation, I ended up losing my apartment because I depleted my savings because I couldn't work. The crazy part is, is that I ended up gaining so much more after that. Like I have two agents right now. I use the magazine to vent and to express how I felt being a new amputee, had no idea that, that, that having those type of conversations would go viral. Um, I'm now like the, uh, maybe a mentor or inspiration to other amputees now, where when I was going through what I was going through, I didn't have anybody to go through, you know, or go to rather. Because generally with breast cancer, you know, women have a plethora of, people to reach out to, but amputees at the time, I didn't know anybody. So luckily I have a very, very great support system with friends and colleagues, and they would just tag me into posts with other amputees. And I ended up becoming um, friends with um, some amputees. So though I missed my leg <laughs> immensely, because I was just very athletic, I ran, played basketball, because I'm 6'4", um, I knew that I had to have my leg removed in order for me to save my life. So um, eight years later, I'm still cancer free. Um, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm even able to just do interviews like this to talk about it. Um, because a lot of people who go through any type of amputation, which was disclosed to me at the hospital, they tend to commit suicide. And so though that was never my mindset to uh, commit suicide, I just knew that I just had to just keep fighting and keep fighting. And then I didn't want to give up anyway because I felt like if I would have get, given up, even though it was my choice, if I would have given up, I just felt like I would have disappointed my mother and my family and my friends. You know, though, you know, your emotions are your emotions. I just use that as an um, as a mechanism to just keep fighting to get to the be to become the person that I am today. Oh my God, I'm speechless. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Yeah, that story is really touching. Thank you. Yeah. Do you do you have a do you feel like like after all these like eight years, you feel any like normalcy right now? Um. Wow, you asking some good questions. So, um, some days I do and some days I don't. Some days I feel like, um, like, wow. And then, cause it, 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 to be honest, sometimes it gets very lonely. Like um, I was the friend who was always the tallest friend. I was the friend who, uh, who always walked faster because I was taller. And now I'm the friend with the limited mobility and the friend that walks slower, you know? So I find myself doing a lot of things by myself because I'll get in my mind and say, I don't wanna be a burden. I don't want to be in nobody's way. So a lot of times I'm doing a lot of things um, by myself. So it, it varies. It, I have my good days and I have my, my bad days. However, I'm grateful that I did after eight years 
um, I started seeing a therapist and she has really helped me release a lot of that baggage that I was holding on to. Like I was holding on to clothes pre-surgery that I couldn't even fit anymore because in my mind, I was just still holding on the fact that I still had my leg. But I've come to terms after going through therapy that my leg is never going to come back. So it's, I've, I'm a firm believer in one of my favorite quotes is, um, it's not what happens to you, it's how you respond to what happens to you. So I know my leg is not coming back. I have an amazing prosthetic leg. I have amazing crutches. And I believe that maybe I went through that to, you know, was to slow me down a little bit, you know, especially working in the entertainment business. We're always like, you know, on the go, on the go, on the go. And so I look at life differently. Um, I'm a little bit more empathetic. Um, I wake up with a sense of gratitude. Um, and I can say at this very moment that I am like very, very happy, you know, and it took me years to get to this point. And I'm just grateful that I'm just even able to discuss what happened to me without breaking down because before I couldn't even talk about it. Like I couldn't even look down where the, 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 the uh, surgery was because my, I was just psyching my mind out that, oh, it's, you know, it's going to come back. Even though I didn't know, I knew it was going to come back. Was it going to come back? I don't know. It's just mentally it was like some miracle is going to happen and what are going to come out with this super advanced prosthetic and then I'll be just like normal. And this, that's just not my reality. So I've, I'm okay with that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> do you, um, so do you have any, like anything you wanna, if you have, like you wanna share, like, or any um, thing you wanna tell like other people who like dealing with the same struggles or like, do you have anything to say? I do. Anybody that's going through any type of trauma in their life, just take your time. Don't let anybody put a time stamp and say, oh, you've been dealing with this for three months or three years or whatever. I'm not saying, <laughs> you know, deal with it for 30 years, but you have to come to a point where you're just going to have to surrender. You're going to have to release it. You're going to have to let it go because you holding on to it is just not going to make the matters um, better. And then being depressed and going through any type of angst can draw in other health ailments and you don't want that to happen. So just pace yourself. And then on the flip side, with people who may be dealing with people who are um, in some type of traumatic state of mind or mental health issues or whatnot, you have to give us grace. You know, we're not often, um, you know, people who are not going going through it can oftentimes, they have this mindset like, well, if it was me, I would snap out of it like that. And it, that's not true. <laughs> you know, so you have to give people grace as they're going through their process. And some people get out of it and some people don't, but whatever decision that they make, you have to respect that. Awesome. Great. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much, Jerry. I really appreciate that. That's a great story. Like, and thank you so much for like telling us about like your story. That's wonderful. No problem at all. all right. do, do you have any question for us? Like at the end? Um, well, I mean, I've been a fan of 360 for like years and, um, you know, <laughs> I, yeah. uh, I just, I just like, I love what you guys are doing. And people always think that because we're, you know, both of us obviously are in the same kind of field, but you guys have your thing going on and I have my thing going on. So I've never really looked at my friends who have, you know, publications and stuff as competi competition. If anything, you know, like what we're doing now, we should be doing things more of a, on a collaborative effort um, because. I don't know who made it up in their mind that old oh, magazines and other 
you know, publications should not do collaboration, but I feel like when you're smaller brands, it's the best thing that we can do, you know? So I'm very grateful that I was being um, considered for this interview because um, sometimes I felt, I feel like, and I've said it, you know, before, sometimes I feel like I don't, people don't see me. And then these random little things will happen. And I'm like, oh, people do see me, but that's just me keeping that humil humility um, so I don't get a big head or a big ego based on feeling like, oh, they, you know, I need to be on the cover of Vogue and I need this to, you know, complete me. I'm just not that guy. So I'm grateful that this is a type of interview that kind of aligns with my purpose and, you know, the conversation that I want to have. And I'm, I'm forever grateful. Thank you so much, Sherry. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, then I think that would be it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. All right. See you later. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. All right. You too. All right. Bye.